Okay, so... Okay, just, just two seconds. I just need to open a couple of files. Mm. Just, let me just say that uh, someone's got their microphone open and there's a bit of background noise. Okay. Yeah, okay, we can hear you too. <laughs> we can also hear Diana. Okay, or Diana. Okay. Um, right, two seconds and I'll start I'll start sharing. Uh see if this works. So which one do I want? I want my I think it's my second screen. No, uh, da, 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 it's this one. Okay, start sharing. Okay, right. So um, hopefully you can see my you can see my um, my document that I'm sharing. Hopefully, although it seems to have gone, it seems to have not gone green. So let me see what it says. Uh, I'm going to stop the. Stop the sharing and do it again. Oh la 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 la! Why are things so complicated? Okay. Okay. Right. So, hello everybody. I hope everyone is okay. Um, I think uh, you will be um, uh, you will be pleased to know that this is the this is actually the last session. Um, so before we before we um, let's say go on uh, to get into the the meat of the of the of the business today um, I just like to thank you for your um, your incredible patience over the last uh, I think it's almost a year uh, and your support in uh, following um, uh, these uh, well these lectures because uh, they are uh, it's difficult to <coughs> it's difficult with uh, um, uh, let's say um, larger numbers of people to do interactive stuff over the over the web um, so thank you thank you very much for your uh, for your support um, okay what uh, what I'd like to do today I've got a couple of things um, first of all I want to finish the thing about the invasive species because um, there's something which uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to bring to your attention which is extremely curious um, and then I'd like to uh, I'd like actually to go through a very let's say a very quick summary of everything that we've uh, had a look at, just to sort of bring things bring the threads bring the threads together, because I think um, with so much material and so much stuff, so many ideas. Um, it's actually very easy to to lose the uh, lose the focus. Uh, and lose the let's say lose the sense of uh, of uh, what what I've been trying to uh, what I've been trying to do here. Okay, so without uh, without further ado, so I'm seeing some nice comments on the chat. So thank you very much for uh, for being uh, for being so, so supportive. Um, so we were talking about uh, we were talking about um, invasive species. And um, I think I can't remember whether we got to some examples from around the world. Yes, uh, I think this is where we started to where we started to um, uh, where I think this is where I got to last time. So um, 
I think just about every every country has its own particular problems with invasive species, depending on uh, where you are. And it's not just Europe, of course, it's across the world that... Uh, um, and the 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 examples that I'm I'm going to pull out here, um, there's a, let's say a European focus simply because we we're, we're in the, this part of the world, let's say. But you can see from this map and this number, these numbers, these are taken from the um, the European Commission uh, website, which deals with invasive species, because there is actually a um, there is actually a committee which uh, a research group which follows this stuff because as we mentioned before <clears throat> these species can have uh, really quite uh, devastating effects on um, on agriculture but also on uh, on local ecosystems uh, and these numbers that you can see in these uh, in these countries um, are numbers associated with uh, let's say um, species which are um, uh, which are in, invading and which are causing problems. Now that doesn't mean to say there's only there are only 40 invasive species in France. Um, there are 40 which are causing particular problems. Okay, so that's the that's the idea here. Um, so uh, some things that we uh, that we um, I found this rather curious, uh, and this is a, just such a such a, a weird uh, a weird headline. Um, the idea of raccoons in Berlin, um, and then you find the backstory uh, is that they were actually, um, although this is not really maybe so so cute because they were actually um, uh, released from a fur farm. Uh, but they were imported into uh, into Germany in the 1930s, um, hence the appellative. Um, uh, but of course, they they got out. Um, they were released uh, in in several different, let's say, uh, locations. But um, they caused quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of annoyance, quite a lot of damage. Um, now. Raccoons are um, notoriously um, cute. <laughs> they are very intelligent. They are very, let's say, cute. But they they're also a bit of a can be a bit of a pest. Um, another example is the uh, Japanese knotweed, which is a quite a um, quite an ornamental plant, but it also happens to be extremely prolific in that um, under the right conditions uh, it can grow a um, phenomenal amount which is uh, if you can imagine 30 centimeters in a day which is really rather uh, rather a lot um, and so what happens is it tends to um, it tends to overpower uh, and dominate, uh, let's say, the local area where it grows. Um, and in fact, there's a, there's a particular term for this. It's called a stand, which is the the shape of the of the plant uh, as a as a full as a, as a fully grown plant. Um, and this particular plant is extremely dense, uh, so lots of big leaves. And so basically, anything uh, anything that's smaller, anything that can't uh, let's say compete in terms of um, getting to the light and the nutrients won't stand a chance okay um, because this is an extremely rapid uh, grower um, of course once you only have uh, once you only have one type of plant as far as an ecosystem is concerned this is a uh, this is a bit of a let's say a bit of a problem because uh, you don't have the uh, the rich biodiversity that a healthy ecosystem uh, actually needs. Um, however, uh, the problem is a little bit more uh, a little bit more serious, particularly in built up areas and um, the it's particularly a problem in the Netherlands because the plant was first imported into a botanical garden in Leiden. Uh, in the 1800s as a, an ornamental plant. Now, it's not the only example of this. There are quite a few examples of uh, people going to 
far-flung places, far-flung corners of the earth, and saying, oh, that's a pretty plant, and taking a sample and bringing it back home, and then finding that it's taken over their garden. Um, and then it escapes. There are lots of, uh, lots of examples of this happening. Um, and this is something which has happened in the Netherlands, and in particular since the 1950s, because it started to spread to, to gardens, and people would... Um, would uproot it, they would uh, take it out from the garden and then throw it away and just dumping, just dump it and uh, of course being such a prolific and um, a, such a vigorous plant um, it was able to quite happily survive these uh, th these attempts to throw it away and this just had the uh, un, let's say the unwanted side effect of actually uh, spreading the plant such that it actually causes um, it actually causes problems with canals um, because it has um, uh, <coughs> it has a particular um, particularly strong root system which is able to uh, penetrate uh, which is able to penetrate into uh, brickwork and uh, concrete okay um, but it's even worse because apparently <laughs> Apparently, the most the most virulent form, uh, the most vir virulent form of this is um, uh, is actually a hybrid. Um, it's so it's a hybrid of two two separate species, um, which in their normal habitats they never come into contact with each other but in Europe in the Netherlands these two hybrids have come these two species have come into contact and they've made a hybrid and this thing is just like a super plant um, uh, I don't know whether anyone has ever um, uh, was ever interested in uh, science fiction films of the 1950s and 1960s there was a, a, a famous film based on a, a book by a story by John Wyndham the day of the triffids and it was about a, a, a post-apocalyptic world in which um, carnivorous plants uh, roamed, <laughs> roamed the streets okay um, not quite carnivorous but the uh, these things are definitely a major major problem um, however uh, and this is something which uh, has been done under very, very strictly controlled conditions. Um, there is a natural, uh, a natural remedy for this, but of course, the problem is potentially to make uh, make things worse by releasing the uh, releasing something to control the plant, and then it goes and does something else. Um, so there is a, a water flea. Uh, which is a type of uh, a type of um, uh, arthropod which lives in the uh, which lives in the, in, uh, in fresh water, um, and this water flea um, in in the normal habitat of this plant keeps the plant under control by feeding on the uh, feeding on the, the shoots and the roots. Um, and so uh, the, the Dutch scientists have been uh, looking very carefully at, at this. The key to it was whether it would be able to survive the Dutch winter. So um, this is uh, uh, this is something that's ongoing. If you're interested, there is <laughs> there is a blog called the Invasives Invasives blog, which is. Uh, some rather weird stuff on there. Okay, uh, the mosquito. Uh, this is something which, particularly for southern Europe, um, particularly for Italy, is uh, very important uh, historically. So you can see that this is um, this is a map from 1932. Uh, of course, it's in Italian, but I think it's fairly easy to see that. Um, the the, zone, the areas where malaria is was in the endemic, um, and you can see uh, so the coasts, the coastal regions of the Veneto. This is the plain. This is the flat plain, the Pianura Padana, um, all around Milan. Okay, um, and it's only when you start to get towards the hills and the mountains that the uh, that
that the the, the malaria is uh, the malaria mosquitoes are under let's say um, are no longer found simply because the the habitat is not suitable. The plain and uh, the, the pontina uh, in the south of Lazio, uh, south of Rome, um, the uh, the area around or behind. Um, uh, the Gargano Peninsula in uh, in Puglia, um, Basilicata. Now these are these are areas, and this sorry, in this area here, southern Toscana, uh, Tuscany. These are areas which historically during this period um, were um, the flat areas which uh, were essentially marshland, uh, and during this period there was a lot of work to reclaim. Uh, these areas from the sea. Um, and so, in fact, if you go to uh, around Grosseto, you go down to Basilicata, these are areas where, and also the, the Agropontina, um, these are areas where uh, the land has been um, has been reclaimed. And this this created um, essentially uh, a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities for the mosquito to um, uh, to breed. Um, and it was only really, uh, it was only really, sort of after the Second World War, with the introduction of DDT, that a lot of this was brought under control. Um, okay, but that's that's the that that's the endemic mosquito. But of course, uh, we now have something which is. Uh, which is far worse than that, or the, which is the, uh, the the tiger mosquito. Now, um, I think anyone who's uh, been on holiday to Italy or who lives here um, will know this guy uh, quite well um, because it's uh, this is an example of a an introduced species which is. Um, Acclimatizing because of the ch because of a changing because of the changing climate. So as the uh, as the climate uh, becomes relatively warmer, um, winters are not cold enough in many parts of the uh, the Italian peninsula. But I, I can imagine also, for example, in Greece and then uh, maybe in Spain as well. Um, they're not co they're not cold enough to kill the uh, to kill the insect. Uh, to kill the the larvae, um, and so uh, these uh, these uh, insects gradually spread. The problem with these guys is that they um, they bite at any time in the day. Uh, they don't just it's not just uh, crepuscular. They don't just come out at uh, um, at twilight. Um, but they also bite any species. Uh, they bite across uh, dogs, cats, uh, all sorts of different mammals, and it's known that they they're um, they're able to transmit um, at least 20 uh, known viruses to to people. So uh, chikung chikung chikung. I can never say this wrong. Dengue fever, yellow fever. There's a whole pile of these things, and some of these, uh, for example, yellow fever is a disease which is associated with the with the tropics. Um, dengue is associated with uh, places in Africa. Um, these are things. These are um, diseases which are starting to be uh, to be seen even in places where. Um, where previously uh, these things weren't present, okay, uh, and it's it's this is uh, this is the the area of coverage. Now, compare. It's interesting because you compare this to okay, 1995. Um, so in the time that I've been in Italy, uh, it started off like this, and now it's like this. Okay, so it's virtually. Um, the only reason why there are a couple of white pieces here is because that's the Grand Sasso. So that's three, that's 2,000, 3,000 meters. Okay, um, but for the rest of it, uh, it's these uh, mosquitoes have been reported. Um, uh, all over, uh, all over southern Europe, um, and they—they they really are. Uh, they're quite aggressive. 
Um, they will bite anything that uh, anything that they can possibly feed off. Um, okay. Uh, in other places, you have okay. you can you can imagine that this type of uh, this type of plant is very pretty. Uh, it's ni a nice and ornamental. You put it in a lake, and the next thing you know, um, there's no uh, there's no no more sunlight for the uh, the, the, the lake. Uh, Excuse me, Julia. Julia, can you can you just can you switch your microphone off, please? Julia. Julia. Excuse me. Puoi chiudere il microfono, per favore. Grazie. Thank you. Okay, so you've got you've got something which is you know, quite obviously a pretty plant, but um, it's bad because uh, these are plants which grow very well in African lakes, um, and they interrupt the water flow. They disrupt. They have a really bad effect on the um, uh, on the ecosystems, and they really uh, sort of uh, uh, once the water starts to stagnate, that's when you start to get uh, mosquitoes uh, breeding. Okay. Um, having said that, uh, there are some quite interesting project, local projects um, uh, involving using this, using these as a resource. So, for example, there's a uh, an engineer in Kenya has uh, worked out a way of uh, harvesting this because it grows very quickly. Um, you can just keep harvesting it, and you can uh, you can create um, cleaner cleaner cooking fuel. Um, another uh, another engineer in another uh, I can't remember whether it's in it's not in Kenya. It's in another African country has won a competition. Um, for use it, for converting the uh, the biomass of this type of plant into a fiber which is able to absorb oil spills, uh, it's able to absorb uh, hydrocarbons. Um, so, uh, and then it, they can be burned for uh, industrial use in, in uh, as fuels. Okay, so uh, there's all you know, all sorts of let's say. Um, uh, all sorts of um, possibilities that people can apply their imaginations to. Um, uh, an invasive species which is prevalent along the um, uh, the south coast of uh, of France and uh, Liguria in Italy uh, that is the invasive uh, palm weevil. And in fact, I re I realise. Now, uh, just a few months ago, um, well, at Christmas time, um, spent some time in uh, Geneva and down near the old port in Geneva, which has been completely re reclaimed, let's say, and uh, modernised and what have you. They have a set of palms, um, and these palm trees are uh, these are mature palm trees, but they are constantly monitored. And in fact, there's a guy. I remember I was sitting reading and uh, there was a guy uh, out there with a notebook and taking measurements and stuff. They're constantly monitored because uh, these uh, these insects, um, they are extremely uh, aggressive and they, well, no, not quite kill, killer palms. <laughs> they, 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 they would be if they fell on you, I think. Um, but they, uh, these things, they, uh, they basically destroy the palm tree from, uh, from, the, uh, from the inside. Um, where do they come from? Well, they have come from Southeast Asia, uh, where they were first found in coconut trees. But they rapidly spread to the Middle East because people were transplanting uh, trees across uh, different parts of the world. And uh, they've got into the uh, the date uh, the date palm plantations in the Middle East, and so and since these are used quite often to supply trees to other countries, um, of course this uh, this this weevil has uh, has spread. This is the type of uh, effect it has. It basically destroys the um, destroys the plant from the inside. Uh, it's difficult to it's difficult to control because quite uh, quite often as happens with parasites and uh, and insect and destructive insects like this if you can find 
the causative agent, if you can actually find what causes the problem, um, you find that they actually have uh, extremely complex life cycles which are difficult to interrupt. Um, and this is, uh, this is also the explanation for why uh, malaria has taken so long to, uh, to come under control because it's actually quite a, a complex, um, uh, quite a complex, let's say, set of uh, interactions in the life cycle of the, uh, the hosts uh, of, the, of the parasite. Um, okay, uh, you may not like snakes, uh, but pythons are, um, let's say, pretty spectacular when you see them, and in particular the Burmese pythons are, uh, let's say, quite iconic because they have these uh, quite amazing sheen, uh, quite amazing um, uh, patterns on their, on their bodies. Um, and they also have the advantage that they are um, non-venomous. The only problem is they're all, they also grow to be quite big. And so you may take home a small snake, but within a few years, it's actually, long, it's actually two meters or three meters long. Um, and this is a bit of a problem. So you throw it away, you decide to get rid of it. Well, you, you let, it, let it go, you release it into the wild. This is what's happened in Florida. Um, and just to give you uh, some statistics here, uh, in certain areas of Florida, in certain national, national parks and um, uh, areas which are controlled, uh, let's say controlled environments, uh, so controlled ecosystems, um, they, there, has, there have been uh, catastrophic, that's the only word for it, catastrophic declines in um, the local populations of indigenous animals and in particular um, it's the medium-sized animals which are not necessarily apex predators but they play they are keystone species if you remember we talk, talked about um, the relationships between different animals in, a, in an ecosystem and how these are there are some species which um, they, they're not at the top of the pyramid but because of where they are in the in the food web um, they play an incredibly important role um, but essentially um, what's happened is because the, the, the pythons are, uh, the, there's no, let's say, there's no natural equivalent in the environment. The, uh, the let's say, the, the, the local species have no defense against it because they don't know uh, how to, how to defend, how to, what to do. Um, pythons can also, um, uh, if I remember correctly, they can also, uh, climb up trees. So um, <laughs> uh, these things are pretty, uh, they're, they're pretty serious and essentially they are, a they are apex predators. Um, you can see here the, 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 the details. Um, in some areas you, they have lost uh, almost all of the opossums, uh, almost all of the uh, raccoons, almost all of the bobcats, and these are, these are major species. Um, and in some other areas there are no more rabbits and foxes. Okay, uh, and so the, and this is the thing, they are apex, they are apex predators, but they are also omnivorous, they will eat anything. Um, if they can swallow it, they will eat it, and that includes uh, people. Well, sort of. Okay, so um, yeah. Okay, I thought this this was rather. This is this is a this is an this is a, this is an incredible story. This one, um, because um, it's <laughs> it sounds like something from a science fiction film, but it's actually real. Um, again, we're back in Germany, so um, we're not talking about raccoons this time. We're talking about these guys. Um, it's the marbled, uh, the marbled crayfish, or in German, the marmel krebs, the marmel krebs, which is um, a crayfish which uh, is sort of like a freshwater lobster. For those of you who are not so familiar with these types of animals, not that I 
not that I am in particular, it's just that lobsters obviously live in the sea. These guys live in fresh water and rivers, uh, lakes and what have you. Um, they are uh, non-specialist feeders, so they will eat all sorts of stuff, um, everything from uh, rotting leaves through to fish, insects, whatever. Okay, um, And they are spreading extremely rapidly. Now this is one amongst uh, several um, arthropod species um, uh, which are affecting um, affecting Germany. Another one is the um, uh, it's a type of crab which has escaped from uh, which has been transported from uh, from China or from East Asia on container ships and it's got into the uh, uh, into the ecosystems around uh, northern Ger the northern German ports. Okay. Anyway, coming back to our crayfish, um, this guy is a native of um, native of Texas or that sort of area in uh, North America okay here we are the marmot cribs that's the guy that's a, a guy who <laughs> was uh, who wrote a, a series who's been re he's been he is keeping this uh, blog spot uh, going um, and it's really quite an in, really quite a, a curious story because the, 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 I, the story goes like this that um, the first examples were found um, were bought by a, um, a biology student um, at a at um, an aquarium, a pet, a pet fair in Frankfurt, and um, the thing is, he thought he was getting a uh, a type of Texas crayfish, which was rather exotic at the time um, to keep in his aquarium. But the problem is that this thing didn't; it just would not stop reproducing. It seemed like it was it was constantly reproducing. But crustaceans don't usually do that. They have cycles like all animals, okay? Um, and so, of course, it's the usual thing. You sort of, uh, you talk to your friends, hey, do you want some crayfish to, to keep in an aquarium? Um, friends, relatives, etc., etc. But, of course, the problem is that as he gave these uh, crayfish away, the people who received the crayfish also reported that these things would not stop reproducing. And so they, they ended up, um, releasing them, as you say, releasing them into the wild, um, and so this is a this is a bit of a problem because they are extremely, uh, let's say, productive. They make you get lots of new crayfish very very quickly, um, and they also uh, they also carry um, they also carry a fungus, which is extremely um, uh, deleterious to the local crayfish species because there are uh, naturally in the in the local ecosystems uh, crayfish um, but the story is very very strange because um, the uh, this marbled crayfish has a number of extremely unusual properties and you can see for those of you who know a little bit about biology and systematics um, there's a rather curious uh, appellative here. Uh, this is the species. This is this will be the species P. phallax. Um, but the there is an, uh, something's been added to this name because it's uh, it's got this uh, virginalis uh, suffix to it. Um, the first thing which is unusual is that this species does not exist in the natural world, sorry, in the, in, the, in natural habitats. The, now it does because it's, it's, it's escaped, if you like, but the species itself didn't come from a natural habitat, okay? And it's thought that what happened was there was, a, there was some sort of cross, crossbreeding going on as it was, uh, as different species were being kept in a, uh, in a, in a, a promiscuous uh, aquarium, let's say. Um, but that's it. That's that. That's only one thing. The other thing is that um, it reproduces by parthenogenesis, which is hence the uh, virginalis uh, suffix, um, which means 
that it does not need a mate. And essentially, all of the uh, all of the um, the marbled crayfish out there, wherever they are, they are all clones. They genetically, they are all identical. Uh, and so the problem is that one individual can found a whole new population. So you only need one. Um, the equivalent, uh, another example of parthenogenesis is uh, is the uh, um, is what happens with the uh, with honeybees, and you get uh, an unfertilized egg uh, becomes the male offspring. Okay. Um, it is known, I mean, there's nothing unusual about this, it's well known, but it's not known, it, it's extremely unusual um, in, the, uh, in the crabs and the lobsters, the decapods, okay? Um, it's even curious, it's even, it's even more curious the, the situation. Um, so they're all clones, um, they mature rapidly, um, and they produce a lot of offspring in any one go. They are extremely aggressive. Um, and basically, they just outcompete. So it's a bit like the uh, it's a bit like the plant, which just grows too big too quickly. Uh, nothing can possibly compete with this. Um, however, this is even more strange because um, there was a, or there is uh, um, a cancer researcher, a professor of oncology at the German Cancer Research uh, Center, and he. Uh, he somehow got to hear about these uh, uh, these animals, and he said, "Well, these are fantastic. These are exact. They are behaving exactly like uh, tumor cells." And so um, he started to investigate them as a model for um, for how tumors uh, spread and how tumors. Uh, um, reproduce because they it's essentially the same uh, the same mechanism so very interesting but then of course there is the question of well what can you do um, and so uh, this is true you can google this um, you need to go on to a website called holy crab uh, and yes uh, as they say if you can't beat them eat them <laughs> And this is what they're doing. Um, essentially, these things are becoming um, are becoming the the go-to street food uh, because they apparently they're quite tasty, um, along with uh, other uh, other invasive species. So yeah, it's the Chinese mitten crabs are the the ones which escaped from the. Uh, they're quite big actually. They're, they're quite there's quite a lot of meat on them. Um, so yeah, uh, so this is <laughs> so this is one uh, one possible solution, um, and apparently um, raccoons are not uh, excluded from the list either. It's a, there is a um, there is a sort of a restaurant. It's a high end restaurant. They have street food. Um, uh, they have street food outlets around the city, but they also have a restaurant, and they serve. Um, uh, they have a, a chef who is uh, spe who is specialised in um, preparing these uh, these rather unusual, let's say, um, rather unusual um, delicacies. Okay, so. Uh, oh, we have future food uh, reproduced so fast. Yeah, exactly. So if you remember, we talked about um, uh, we talked about in the the food when we talked about the food system. Uh, one of the things that's likely to be coming over the next, or well, let's say, in the near future, is um, uh, the the uh, insects. Uh, more widespread use of insect protein for a number of reasons um, but essentially as someone pointed out to me a, a few years ago um, when you look at a lobster um, you're actually just looking at a, an arthropod um, and arthropods well they include the insect of course so uh, there's nothing there shouldn't be anything particularly unusual about this uh, this this idea the problem is this balance of uh, of the let's say of the local ecosystems and the uh, the local species which um, are 
under which come under a lot of pressure already under a lot of pressure uh, because of um, because of urban development or, or because of changing conditions and then they come under further pressure from um, uh, from competition uh, or yeah from competition um, with species which uh, they don't. Uh, they don't have the, let's say, the means to uh, to compete with. Okay, so I don't know whether anyone's got any uh, any questions or any comments about. I've seen a few comments on the uh, 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 if anyone's got any comments about these um, these invasive species. But it's clearly it's it's a big um, it's a big it's a potentially a big problem um, okay so uh, okay so what I'm going to do now is I just need to open another just going to open my um, open my summary slides okay so if you just bear with me two seconds let's just open that and I just need to Okay, maybe. I'm not sure whether that's open. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Let me just check. So, okay. No, I don't need that. just need that one. Okay. Right, okay. So, hopefully you should be able to see the, um, the screen uh, again. So, I'm just going to... Uh, <coughs> I'm just going to sort of go through a sort of a summary of what we've what we've covered over the last well 10 months I think it is because we started in April um, if anyone has any comments please uh, please put uh, put stuff on the chat okay um, and uh, we'll see I'll, I'll keep an eye open for uh, for the comments as we go through. If anyone has any questions also, anything that maybe um, maybe is not so, uh, may, things that weren't clear or things that need clarifying, please um, uh, please just uh, just ask. Okay, so um, okay, so I think this is the this is the whole. Uh, the whole uh, course that we've done, um, not necessarily in this order, because I think this was the original. We've maybe missed out one or two things, but I think the over overall we've uh, we've covered most things. Um, so, as I, as I said right at the beginning, um, as we set out, as we started, the. The core, the the idea was to try try and pull together uh, <coughs> it's clear that there are there is a, there's a lot of let's say there's a lot of stuff here um, and it goes from it goes from any, everything from um, simply thinking about conservation simply thinking about pollution simply simply thinking about waste but also uh, we have to if you don't need to go very far to find that behind these things we have technology we have the way we live the way we've uh, we've set out uh, our way of uh, of, um, of living in the modern modern world so um it's quite clear that the the whole area is extremely uh, is extremely broad, um, and it's it can be so broad that you can be left feeling quite helpless. Um, but as uh, Maria Carmen says on the chat, um, it it's clear that in some way we need to act, in some way we need to react to the situation. Um, so in a way, I think part of my intention here but not just for you guys also for myself was to use this as an opportunity to dig a little bit further and find out a little bit more because okay um, it's one thing having a general interest in, uh, in 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 science that's that's where I typically come from 
uh, because I find these things curious. I find things curious. I find things uh, interesting. But then um, that's only part of the story, of course, because it's this informing yourself in order to be able to make um, an informed choice or an informed decision about action. Um, and so taking some of these uh, aspects in, uh, let's say in particular, I think if I think if we look at uh, if we look at any of those uh, topics in particular in detail, I think the one word which we would um, uh, which we would apply uh, or which we would which I think we could say underlies all of these uh, topics is complexity. Um, and that complexity, where does it come from? Well, the comp I think uh, it's reasonable to argue that the, the, the complexity comes from, um, first of all, in some cases, it's the complexity of the physical system itself. So if we think about the world and we think about climate change and we think about greenhouse gases, um, you have, uh, let's say, the complex, uh, the complexity, the complex nature of the inter interactions between different parts of this um, uh, geophysical system. So you have the, uh, the the sunlight and the energy distribution stuff, and it gets into really quite, let's say, um, uh, complex uh, physics and maths and chemistry. Um, but when you look at that in the context of a, uh, a not just of a planet, but the planet of, in on which we live. Um, this adds a whole set of a whole series of further layers of complexity. So, where you have people involved, you're going to be talking about um, you're going to be talking about uh, culture. You're going to be talking about social aspects of things. You're going to be talking about um, the food supply, the impact of feeding so many people uh, on the environment. Uh, you're going to be talking about development. You're going to be talking about uh, technology um, and a whole set of things. And a lot of this revolves around the economic system. Um, and so what we have is we have, I think we have different uh, different layers of um, uh, different layers of um, of interactions within the uh, within the system uh, according to how you view the system and I think the key thing is that uh, we are we aren't talking about a geophysical system on its own we are talking about a human system as part of the geophysical system or humans as part of the whole thing of course so uh, this is where this I think complexity is the word that um, conjures that really sort of captures the um, captures the situation um, and I'd like to bring our our attention back to um, a guy which most people have never heard of but apparently was very famous in his day um, but he did leave us with this um, I think rather uh, rather useful quote and it's particularly adapted to these days I think because um, there are many many people who are proposing um, simple solutions to complex problems and as Mencken said for every complex problem there is an answer that is clear simple and wrong now um, I could go into a little bit more detail about uh, the, the the systems theory of uh, of uh, of, con of control in the sense that um, you need to have um, you need to have um, in any complex system to manage the system you need to have um, let's say the the control functions at same level of complexity or higher than the system that you're trying to come the part of the system you're trying to con control 
sounds a bit weird, but it actually it actually comes from um, uh, uh, Stafford Beer and the um, the uh, all of the thinking around cybernetics, which is um, uh, which gets very technical. But the the the, the point is that um, whenever you come up with a um, Whenever you come up with a, a solution which is inadequate or which is not, which does not, which is not able to um, fully answer the question, you're uh, fully and fully, let's say, um, meet the requisites of the problem, um, it's going to fail. Um, now we looked at uh, we looked at. In very 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 brief de very very brief um, session on um, the tragedy of the commons, which is an example of systems thinking, but as uh, as Einstein said, we can't solve problems with the same thing we used when we created them, and this is the this comes back to this idea of you need a higher level of control in order to uh, in order to to act. It, Einstein said it in a in a, um, in a very clear way that um, there's no point in thinking in the same way if you're expecting different results. Okay, and and there is the old phrase that um, if you do what you did, you get what you got. <laughs> okay, so um, we talked about uh, I mentioned this idea of thinking in systems. So this is the idea of looking at um, not things in, uh, not necessarily in an abstract way, but looking at problems as multifaceted, um, and being aware of the uh, of the complexity that they uh, that they propose to you. So we talked about uh, the tragedy of the commons. And the example was the um, uh, was the fishing uh, the fishing. Um, grounds in the, in the grand banks and I think the big tragedy of this is that it's happening again and again in other places around the world. The example is well described, it was well known back in the uh, back in the 70s and the 80s um, and yet there is an insistence on um, uh, you make, you, it, as they say, you make a quick buck, a fast the fast money now, and who cares about the future? Um, and this is what um, this is what Dr. Zeus was talking about in the Lorax. Okay, and just sort of coming back to uh, coming back to the let's say personal um, involvement in this. It's this uh, is this thing. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So in other words, this is a. It's a, a call to engagement. Okay. Um, so, uh, why is this model? And I, I'd suggest you you look at this, go and find out more information about the tragedy of the commons, because um, the tragedy is that uh, resources are shared, but the uh, let's say the the benefits are taken by a certain group of people. The costs are taken by other people, and um, there are whole reason, whole reasons, a whole number of different reasons for um, arguing that this is uh, absolutely un. It's no longer sustainable. Not that it was morally sustainable in the past, but it's no longer sustainable now. And in particular, where you have uh, where you have people. Um, with uh, well, um, extreme um, access to resource, which uh, um, allows them to essentially do what they do what they want. Okay, so this is the example of the the, the Grand Banks fishery. Um, What's this based on? Well, if you remember, and if you have, if you if you are interested, I do suggest you go up and go onto the web and look for something about systems thinking, um, and in particular, um, well, systems dynamics is the is the more let's say technical end of it, but there are uh, there are other accessible 
uh, areas. So, for example, I'll just put a, something in the chat here. Um, I think this material is, is uh, available now. Uh, the Open University University um, Systems uh, Thinking um, modules. I think they're now um, widely available. You don't. Uh, there's no. Uh, there's no pay for access for that, if I remember correctly. Um, what's underneath all of this? It's this idea of um, things don't just happen at random. There are interconnections, and there are relationships between. Um, between things within systems which cause the system itself to behave in a particular way. Um, you have the idea of uh, emergence, which is that the, um, the behavior cannot be predicted from its parts, okay? um, but the relationships are always based on feedback loops. And there are basically two types of feedback loops. There's the uh, the positive uh, loop, which Jimi Hendrix used to such great effect when he was playing his guitar. Um, and then you have the negative feedback loop, which is um, uh, something which tends to control. So the positive loop will amplify and make something worse or, or increase something. Whereas the um, the negative loop will tend to keep this under control. So in a stable system or in a system which is considered to be in some form of um, equilibrium or in some form of stability, uh, the the let's say the the effects of the negative loops and the positive loops loops balance out. Okay, but what then happens? And if we think about the invasive species, so you have a, a, an, a an ecosystem which is all nicely balanced, um, but then you build a factory um, and down the down the road uh, near the river, the river's nice and happy, but then you start pouring your waste into the river, and of course that upsets the ecosystem, um, and that causes the system to go out of uh, to go out of um, out of equilibrium or out of stability. Um, same thing happens with physical systems such as or physical uh, uh, processes such as the the example given here, the, the water cycle. Um, so you have uh, you have this idea of um, systems are collections of interactions and the interactions are defined by either amplifying or um, controlling uh, behaviors and it's what you see the what you see in the in the um, in the the behavior of the system what you observe is a result of this stuff that's going on underneath it's the structure of the thing and that's what we have to be thinking about because we need to be thinking about where can I act because that if you understand the structure uh, or you you have a better appreciation of the structure that gives you more uh, places where you can actually do something this is an example of a, of a positive uh, feedback loop so um, again this is a big a big cycle related to ocean warming. Okay, so what sort of stuff did we look at? Well, we looked at um, looked at all sorts of things related to modern life. So um, the things that we keep around us, the things that that we use, the technologies, um, how we uh, feed and clothe clothe ourselves, um, how things get how things get moved around. Um, there was a statistic. I, I've gathered a few statistics in this particular selection of slides here. Um, so this idea of possession, this idea of accumulating stuff, and I know that I'm extremely guilty of this, uh, but if you think about an estimate, estimate that um, an average American home contains about 300,000 different objects. Um, that's a hell of a lot. Um, if files in a computer were objects, uh, um, the next time you do a, a, a virus scan, 
uh, on your computer just see how many files <laughs> just a normal a normal computer see how many files it scans um, it's just unbelievable how uh, how many uh, how many things are parts of these uh, complex systems um, so we have uh, we have this idea of accumulation but of course um, many many of the things that, uh, that we keep around us are also a result of um, how we brought up and we have uh, emotive um, memories attached to particular things and so it's clear that over a lifetime um, uh, over a lifetime you can uh, you can build up quite a quite a quite a collection um, quite a collection of uh, of things which you get reluctant to um, uh, let's say to do without okay we talked about um, food producing food um, uh, many of us uh, many of us uh, most of us don't actually live in a, in a situation where we could actually grow our own food or supply our own food um, so we have to rely on uh, other people to do this for us but of course other people are a lot better at doing it um, we wouldn't have time because we do other things but that's part of modern society um, as soon as you have a uh, a possibility of producing a, a food surplus this allows uh, society complex society to develop in the way it has uh, developed um, and so of course uh, when we're thinking about food uh, we think we have to be thinking about agricultural systems but we're also thinking excuse me about um, industrial systems because these uh, the amount of the amount of food, the sheer quantities of food which uh, which is uh, which are needed uh, to supply cities, to supply um, however many billions of people there are on the planet these days, it's clear that you're, you 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 need large scale um, large scale production uh, in order to make things uh, efficient we had a look at some ideas of um, uh, you know near the near potential near future where uh, the um, maybe the the production of food is brought back into or is brought into uh, a closer relationship with the cities themselves so the idea of, uh, of farming vertical farming um, and uh, farming within uh, in under arti let's say artificial conditions which have uh, advantages and disadvantages um, and uh, in some cases the advantages uh, can be quite can be quite considerable um, we talked about uh, food waste and if we remember that um, something like half of the uh, uh, half of the food produced is um, uh, so sorry a third of, produ of the food produced is wasted at different points along the, the food production chain um, and half of that which is wasted is wasted in households um, that tells us that there's maybe quite a bit that we can do there um, in terms of uh, educating um, ourselves and other people to avoid uh, avoid this. Now, I think um, with food waste that we tend to uh, sort of think of things in terms of like a moral argument. It, it's not moral. It's not ethically right to to waste food because other people are going without. But there's also, let's say, the environmental impact. Um, uh, aspect which we should never really forget that um, by the time the food gets to your house or into the supermarket um, it's taken in water it's taken in um, minerals it's taken in fertilizers or whatever um, and it's taken in energy for it to get to where it is and so um, by throwing it away essentially you are wasting uh, you are wasting these extra uh, uh, these let's say these component parts of it 
um, simply thinking about fruit, for example, um, uh, some fruit has uh, is almost <laughs> almost all water, um, and so uh, the idea of wasting uh, wasting that in in a context in which um, uh, water is becoming increasingly an increasingly scarce resource. It's uh, it, it's it's important that uh, that we get this under. Let's say uh, we get this um, uh, under control. So um, so we've talked about uh, so we've talked about the uh, the fact that food production has a very very big impact on um, on the environment. Um, Everyday technology, all of those uh, here were saying, all of those machines that do work for us, including computers and smartphones and all sorts of stuff. And these, excuse me, these are these are things which um, uh, we just use and we just take for granted. But within your smartphone, which thinking about it 30 years ago was was essentially a piece of science fiction. Uh, within your within your smartphone, um, you have <coughs> you have elements, um, semi metals, metals which are um, rare earth metals, whatever, which are, are um, uh, vital for the function of the technology. Without these, uh, without the, the the amazing properties of these things, the technology wouldn't work. Um, but we are becoming ever more dependent on these, uh, on, on the uh, the functioning of these technologies. But at the same time, we're also running out of some of these things. So um, simply the the statistic that the that uh, there is now um, there is more gold in a ton of discarded smartphones than in a ton of the best, I say the best uh, gold bearing ore. In uh, in the world, so uh, the difference is that it's e it's easier to get it out of rocks than it is to get it out of smartphones. Um, the people are working on it, but um, uh, th this gives, this just gives you a um, an idea of let's say another thing, another aspect of complexity. Um, we talked about um, interconnectivity. We talked about this idea of uh, uh, internet, smart kitchens, and smartphones and stuff. And then what happens when things don't work? Um, we looked at energy. So uh, who is using how much? And we can see that um, Europe is actually relatively uh, the energy uh, energy uh, efficiency or energy use in Europe is relatively constant. Um, but it's clear that uh, in other parts of the world, particular, <coughs> excuse me, particularly those parts of the world that are undergoing demographic, uh, rapid demographic growth, um, the uh, energy needs are um, increasing uh, really quite uh, quite rapidly, um, and this, of course, is linked to. This is, of course, is linked to the production of um, greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. Um, coming, coming to waste, we talked about. I um, just said something about food waste, but waste in general. Um, the five R's. Uh, we revised the five R's, which is uh, the idea of. Um, Refusing to make it in the first place, so thinking about whether something is needed or not. Um, reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. Um, recycling is the, let's say, is the the, um, uh, the final step uh, in this uh, in this, let's say, this scheme this scheme of things. Um, but the uh, the whole point here is to be more aware. Of what uh, what we are what we are doing, um, I think there is a um, there's a movement towards becoming a more thoughtful 
uh, a more thoughtful consumer. In other words, um, buying just what you need or taking in just what you need and um, also avoiding things like plastic bags, for example, take a, take a cotton bag, all of this sort of stuff. Um, supporting uh, movements for, for example, the right to repair. And this is such a strange thing because once upon a time, not even so long ago, um, it was assumed that you would repair things uh, when they stopped working. Um, now it seems like you have to have uh, you have to have the law on your side because otherwise you um, you're not able to uh, repair things which are your own. Okay, um, what gets in the way of us recycling? Well, uh, you may be um, you may be confused by what you find when you've got you look at the the container, you look at the thing you've you've. Uh, you've taken the value from it, you know, the, the food it contained or whatever, and now you're left with the container. You think, well, what do I do with this? And it's not, it's not clear. Um, for those of you who um, uh, for those of you who maybe uh, don't know it, uh, Junker is a, uh, a useful, uh, it's a useful app. Um, I think it's actually quite widely used now across Europe in different countries. Um, very clever little thing. You put it on your phone and if you have any doubt about the packaging of something, um, you can scan the barcode and in many cases it will tell you what, uh, what, what that thing is made of and how to dispose of it. Um, if it's not clear, you can... Uh, photograph the uh, the thing, and if you know uh, if you know how to deal with the um, uh, how to deal with the with the with the waste, you can actually put in a report, and so it becomes part of a it's a citizen database. And I think it's th this type of thing is is um, is good because it's it's a really clever use of uh, of technology because it allows people in all different places to uh, contribute information, contribute data to this, this database, which builds up um, very quickly, um, considering that in most, let's say, uh, in most places, the sorts of materials, the sorts of things that you're buying are rel almost always the same sorts of things. So um, over time, uh, it's built up to be quite, uh, let's say, let's say, quite comprehensive. But it also gives you the uh, gives you the possibility of contributing. Um, so there's a, there's a comment from uh, Maria Carmen. Uh, reusing is also a good solution. We tend to have everything new, but as a mother of three, I can say that reusing is possible. Absolutely, um, uh, hand me downs, of course, um, particularly for really small children where. The they don't the, the the clothes are not big enough for them to uh, or let's say the, the the children young children spend so little time in the in the in the thing that it doesn't have time to wear out. So um, there is a almost a constant pressure for um, because of because of, uh, of growth. Okay, um, we talked about uh, ecosystem services. Now, this may be something that you don't remember so much, um, uh, but it's this idea of um, not just the ecosystem is just what it is, a bunch of trees on a hill with some insects and birds. Um, it's actually this idea that um, ecosystems actually provide uh, service benefits to uh, to people because of what they provide people with so for example there are the, there is uh, the, the, the food um, uh, there is water um, there is uh, the benefit of climate uh, uh, mitigation so for example um, you may have uh, thinking of an example in uh, in the UK where the there is there's been the reintroduction of beavers along a certain part of uh, some rivers in um, in southeast England 
and uh, originally, initially the, there was quite a bit of opposition because uh, the um, pe because local people thought that this this would be quite disruptive. Um, however, it's been proved again and again and again uh, in different parts of uh, different parts of the world that introduction of keystone species like beavers um, they are ecosystem engineers. And if you let them get on with what they with what they do, um, you find that the rivers are more con uh, under more control in the sense that they don't flood so much because of the way the uh, the beavers control the um, uh, the flow rates of the water. And there's a whole set of um, a whole set of additional benefits which come from this and um, these people, uh, these local people have also now got into the idea of uh, um, they go and watch these animals doing what they do and so you have this idea of, uh, um, of the, let's say the, um, the cultural and spirit, spiritual benefit <coughs> of having um, of, of being closer being closer to nature and, nature and being proud of uh, uh, of, of being able to reconstruct this uh, um, uh, reconst reconstruct this habitat. Um, so uh, this is without going into the into the details here. But if you remember that we have the um, the idea of the not just uh, not just food and water, but you also have the um, the genetic resources of the of the environment of the ecosystem. Um, you have the regulating uh, the regulating um, actions of the uh, of the ecosystem, such as um, pollination, um, climate mentioned. So yeah, there's a whole uh, there's a whole set of things. Cultural heritage, for example, um, if you want a really good example of this, you just have to go into any community in uh, in a mountain area. Um, uh, and typically, these uh, these types of communities are very closely, let's say, um, their culture and their let's say outlook is very closely linked to the um, the, the, the territory, the, the mountain territory in which they live. Um, we talked about the um, uh, the efficiency of uh, of uh, ecosystem f um, energy flow in terms of uh, going from um, the sun through the plants through the consumers up to the predators now this is in terms of the um, this is in terms of the uh, let's say the uh, an ecosystem where we have um, uh, a mix of plants and animals um, but you can also we also met this in the um, in the section where we talked about uh, food production because this is very very closely linked to the uh, the economics and also the um, um, the energy uh, and waste production of um, of large scale food production because <coughs> if you can you can quite easily see. Um, the advantage of uh, of being a primary consumer of a plant rather than a secondary consumer of a herbivore. Okay, so uh, it's clear that um, you get uh, it's a lot more efficient in terms of uh, energy um, uh, en energy transmission, um, and so the idea of um, Thinking more carefully about meat production in particular, because the the problem is the uh, the the growth of intensive um, intensive uh, meat farming, um, which is so which is associated with um, in many countries it's associated with the idea of um, economic economic success or economic uh, wealth. Um, um, and so being able to afford meat even though it has an extremely um, or it can be extremely deleterious for the environment um, 
it's clear that there's an incompatibility there. Um, so this is something which is is central to um, uh, is central to uh, the idea of thinking very carefully about what we can do. Okay, we talked about uh, we talked about plastics um, and plastics are in, uh, an incredibly important part of um, modern uh, let's say modern life. You just have to look around you to see how much plastic there actually is. And even though you may say, well, we need to do we need to do without plastics. Um, can you imagine a smartphone made of uh, metal, wooden, uh, glass? I don't think it's going to really work. Um, so a certain amount of plastics, um, and particularly those which are more technical and which are used for very particular, um, very particular re uh, uses, uh, a certain amount of plastics um, are needed. But where things have gone where things have gone wrong is the abuse of the uh, of this this type of technology. So the fact that 40% of packaging is uh, plastic made of plastic, um, when it's clear that 40% of when it's clear that a lot of this does not have to be made of plastic, um, particularly for food, because once upon a time. Um, there were perfectly adequate, uh, um, perfectly adequate. Uh, there was perfectly adequate packaging uh, of other types. So it's clear in some cases that this uh, that that there is a you can you can justify continued use, but in other cases uh, you can you, know, you, you can um, imagine that well. Um, it would be better not to uh, not to use these things. Um, I think we might have said something about. I think it seems to remember we talked about biodegradable, um, although not in not in a lot of detail. Because one of the um, I think one of the one of the red herrings that is uh, quite often. Uh, quoted in when we're talking about plastics is ah yes okay my plastic is fine because it's biodegradable that's fine but think about it the it's a bit like wasting food isn't it um, in the sense that to arrive at a biodegradable plastic fork or biodegradable plastic plate you have uh, you've put in the energy and the water and um, the time, etc., to create the thing. When in fact um, it could have been, um, it could quite easily have been replaced with a uh, simply a, a metal fork that you could wash afterwards. Okay, so. Um, this is something which needs to be uh, which needs to be challenged some sometimes biodegradable is not necessarily uh, is not necessarily um, the the best uh, the best route um, so recycling at the same recycling is a uh, is something which we can all do and which we all do I think. Um, but as mentioned with the with the junker, sometimes it can be uh, frustrating because of the um, the need to separate and the need to understand what things are made of when it's not so easy to to, to find out. Um, I think that there is a lot of scope for action here in terms of. Um, Sharing information uh, in terms of uh, sharing sharing um, how to how to do things how to uh, how to how to recycle, but also pressure pressuring uh, for making things simple so that people can't make mistakes. So, for example, instead of having composite plastics or having a, having a packaging which is made of two different things, two different materials. 
why can't it just be made of one? So I'm thinking about the um, the boxes with the with the plastic windows. Uh, you know what's in the box, um, and if you open the box when you get it home, and it's not what it's not what it should be, and it's not what it should be. Of course, you will take it. You will take it back to the shop. Um, so I think that uh, certain things could be made a lot a lot easier. Okay, so we talked about um, the urban environment. We talked about cities, um, which are. Uh, th this is a very, really fascinating area. I think if I were to, uh, if I were to have uh, 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 have another go at, uh, at at life, I would maybe um, maybe be a, a an architect or an engineer, some description. But anyway. Um, Cities are fascinating places, um, and they create their own climates. And this is part of the uh, the the, uh, the idea of the climate uh, climate change. And part of that is driven by um, changing the physical uh, the physical nature, the physical characteristics of uh, of um, environments in particular places. So just thinking about the uh, um, just thinking about the, the microclimates down in in amongst these skyscrapers. Of course, you have uh, a whole uh, the, the whole energy balance, the whole way of en the whole way that the energy is transmitted and transferred through this system is changed simply because you have um, you you have uh, air currents which have to move in particular directions. Uh, but also you have uh, buildings which are in shadow apart from for 30 seconds of sunlight uh, once a year, something like this, okay? And so you get uh, you get phenomena like urban heat islands where uh, for a series of reasons, particularly because of um, materials that, uh, that buildings are made of, um, energy is absorbed and then uh, released over time. Um, and this uh, leads to a whole set of positive feedback uh, loops, such as um, the city is hotter. So what do you do? You turn on the uh, air conditioning a bit more. Uh, you turn that up, and of course that just means that you're generating more heat because what you're doing with air conditioning is you're transferring heat from one place um, and using energy to do this. Uh, and you're, boost, you, you're throwing it away in another place. Okay, so you, you essentially you are um, just adding to the adding to the problem um, within this idea of uh, within this uh, uh, this context of um, climate and heat. Uh, of course, we could we we couldn't not say anything about uh, the greenhouse gases. Um, and we have uh, a number of uh, a number of greenhouse gases that we've met. Uh, we've met we met carbon dioxide, which is by far the um, let's say the largest contributor to the uh, greenhouse um, effect. Um, however, we also have um, methane, and we also have. Uh, other uh, smaller uh, amounts of uh, of gases such as nitrous oxide and the, and the fluorinated gases, but what we did learn, I think, or what we did uh, find was that um, not all greenhouse gases are equal, uh, and this refers to not just their potential for holding the energy um, but their potential lifetime as well. So um, some of these gases are very potent, but they have relatively short lifetimes. Others, like carbon dioxide, is maybe not so uh, not so potent, but it is a, it is a, a strong greenhouse gas in any case. Um, but it hangs around for a long time. So what that means is that. Anything we put into the environment, into the atmosphere um, now, is going to be around in uh, 80, 70 or 80 years time. Which means that uh, in order to see effects of um, reducing emissions, 
um, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but we do need to reduce the emissions simply because we're talking about something which is happening in the future, but not not necessarily in our lifetime. And I think that's one of the big one of the big problems with uh, with the um, with with the ideas of, uh, of of action. It's difficult to act when you're not necessarily acting for yourself, but you're acting for uh, people in the future who um, uh, you're acting for a future that you can't possibly know. Um, so I, again, this is a this is a, a characteristic of a, of a complex system, which is um, action uh, now doesn't necessarily mean a result tomorrow. Okay, so um, we talked about the um, we talked about the different uh, different parts of the atmosphere where the greenhouse gases are, and um, how in any case um, it doesn't matter where these things are produced or whatever they are sp gases are spread around the uh, uh, spread around the atmosphere um, rather sort of quite evenly um, okay uh, so coming back two seconds about food um, it's estimated or it's projected that um, food demand is going to increase by uh, 2030 um, but we had this uh, rather uh, rather alarming statistic which is that um, there's more than enough food produced mm -hmm. for everybody but um, nearly well 80, 800 million people are uh, undernourished they don't get enough food um, the food system has developed enormously since uh, 1945 um, and in particular it's associated with the so-called Green Revolution which has led to uh, a, a number of advances in um, the efficiency of food production but which has also led to uh, a more standardized approach to uh, growing things so we saw the idea of um, uh, the ge genetic diversity, the traditional crops, is, crops are um, uh, becoming less and less. There, there are fewer of these uh, traditional species, um, simply because they don't, they, they, they're not as, let's say, as efficient for the farmer. Um, they cost more. They um, uh, they don't give him uh, as much, or they don't give her as much return on uh, on the investment of uh, of time and effort, and also, uh, for example, for resources in terms of water, etc. So um, there's a let's say there's a an element of um, uh, genetic diversity within the uh, food system which is which is reduced, but there's also um, the food system itself is subject to uh, this changing uh, consumer um, consumer pressure, pressures, consumer desires, and so I think this is a uh, reasonable, uh, let's say, um, a reasonable representation of the, the complexity of the, of the food system uh, from the inputs which essentially if we think about about this what is it this is about getting the um, getting energy from sunlight which is trapped into trapped in um, in plants and uh, through uh, sometimes via animals within the within the farm supply uh, system but it's essentially getting this energy through to people who don't um, don't grow stuff, okay? And all of this is taking part within uh, a, r a very complex set of interactions. Um, we've got uh, comments about the public perception of what's going on. Now, this was a I think this was a report in the Guardian newspaper uh, towards the end of last year. Um, it seems like, well, uh, to be honest with you, I think uh, I think some of these numbers are still sort of rather disappointing. The fact that um, uh, 
uh, only 57 people, 57 percent of people. This is in the U no, this was actually not in the UK. It was across several different Euro European countries: um, UK, Germany, France, and Belgium, I think. Um, but this idea that uh, at the top we have um, waste, recycling, fine. Um, Pollution, fine. These are this is the sexy stuff. This is the obvious stuff. This is the stuff which is um, relatively uh, relatively accessible. But what we don't have is we don't have we have no conception of the fundamental role of CO2. I think this is this is the thing which tells you that um, uh, you can recycle all you want, but the climate is still going to change. Okay, so uh, it's this idea of um, uh, we need to get uh, we need to get our heads around um, energy and CO2 production because this is something which is is going to be fundamental to um, to moving towards uh, being sustainable. Sustainability. Yes, uh, the idea of recycling, the idea of uh, deforestation, protecting animal species, etc., etc. This is part of sustainability, but this is the part which is going to um, really impact uh, how sustainable things actually uh, actually are in the end. Okay. Um, The idea of not necessarily waiting for um, for politicians, because of course we know that the political we know that political systems are open to um, influence in various directions, and that's not necessarily the influence that is um, uh, useful to carry out large scale changes. Um, but the change changes have to have to happen. Because otherwise, um, uh, things are not uh, uh, things. The, the 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 impact of climate change is just going to um, is just going to increase. Okay, I think I think that's it. I think that's it. So I th I just remember this this phrase from one of the. Uh, uh, I think it was the it was the the session on the transition towns. Um, this idea of um, doing more with uh, with less, okay. So uh, whether that is actually accepting that we uh, don't need to consume so much stuff, or whether it's uh, look actively looking for ways in which we can reduce um, things, the amount of stuff that we're using, and uh, uh, so on. Okay, so that's it, I think. Um, yes, there you go. So um, we've got we've got about fifteen minutes or so, I think. So if anyone has any uh, any questions or any comments, um, I realise that these sessions so two hour two hours is is quite a long time for you guys to listen, and it's quite a long time for me to talk. Um, so I hope uh, I hope this has given you uh, given you some ideas. Um, I don't know. So if anyone has any um, if anyone has any comments. Okay, okay, thank you, Gordon. Yes, yeah. Now hold on, hold on a minute. I just have to turn up my. Right, who's who's speaking? I can't see who. Uh, it's Maria. Okay. Okay, so um, I just want to thank you for everything. Uh, okay. um, after one year, I have some feeling that I, I have met you. You know, eye to eye, <laughs> face to face, not just <laughs> face. Uh, through these um, terrible uh, screens. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Actually, also, I want to thank for um, anyone who organized this beautiful section sessions, and um, I'm more than grateful. 
So I want you all the best, you to your families and for for all the uh, attendance. And I learn so much because uh, I'm not uh, in uh, this uh, kind of science. I'm um, teacher for um, Croatian language, but I'm also interested in in uh, everything that you said. So I learn so much. Okay, thank no, you very th much. Th no, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for for sticking with it because it's yes. uh, it, this is there's a lot of stuff here and it's. Uh, I think sometimes it's a little bit uh, it is a little bit difficult but no thank you thank you very much thank you very much I hope I hope it's maybe given you some ideas about um, you know, uh, uh, some things that maybe you can do uh, you can do at home or you can do with uh, uh, in your in your own context you know, for example um, the thing about recycling or the thing about waste or the whatever um, so hopefully it's given you some sort of uh, some sort of ideas so thank you very much Okay, so Kamal say I think the change begins in an individual level. Yeah, uh, we should be able to be the ones we wish to see. Yeah, exactly. You have to imagine the change, and then do it. Do it actively. Uh, take part yourself. Um, as I say, I think um, in some cases uh, there's also um, a place for advocacy for. Um, making the change easier. So, you know, just the just the really stupid example of not knowing which bin to throw something in. <laughs> um, simply, uh, you know, why why do things have to be so complicated? Why not just uh, why not just make it such that um, packaging must be made of Poly, everything's made of polypropylene. I don't know, but just make it um, just make it easy. Okay. Okay. So hopefully, Anne, okay, Anne is uh, from Lithuania. Is uh, um, I, yeah. I hope we can make this change because it's it's definitely something that we need to we need to be doing. Okay, so no, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for your uh, for your attention. Yeah, so the the subjects themselves. I mean, if we think about it, it's just it really is such a. It's just almost like everything. And the the problem, if anything, is that there's too much. And so you say, oh well, what can I do? I'm just one. I'm just me. But as Kamal said, you have to start somewhere. Change has to start somewhere. And um, so by, um, you know, by, let's say, concentrating on doing what you can and spreading the word, I think that that's, uh, that's the important thing. We have to start somewhere. Uh, okay. Right. Um, okay. Okay. So, okay. I hope, as I say, I hope, uh, I hope you've you've managed to uh, you managed to get something from this. Um, it's uh, it's rather, let's say, rather a rather a lot of information here. Um, I think the video. I think the videos are uh, available on the uh, on the website. So um, you can always just download the videos and then uh, take the sound off if necessary. Um, okay. Hello, Gordon. Hello. 
Oh, nice to be. Ah, eccolo. Hey. Nice. Ciao. Ciao. Ok, uh, fermo il record. Hai finito?